Um, welcome. Thank you for, for joining us at this briefing that is going to really cover the uh, Chittenden County response to the state of Vermont sunset of their pandemic motel program. In this briefing, we're going to discuss what we believe the impact of this closure, this end of the state program it is going to have on Chittenden County and what the city of Burlington and many other organizations working in coordination with each other are planning to do in response to this challenge. Um, I wanna point out at the outset that the plans that we're gonna discuss today have come together very quickly um, under very tight timelines that have been driven by state decisions. The state uh, issued a request for letters of intent on May 22nd. The city responded on June 1st last Thursday, which is the first day that responses could be submitted in response to that state request. And we are also gonna be speaking in this briefing about a planned letter of interest from the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, which is a uh, coalition of 27 agencies in Chittenden County that work on the homelessness challenge one way or another. And that alliance is meeting formally later this week to approve the plan that we're going to talk about today and, and submit it as, a, as an LOI. Here's how this briefing is going to work. I'm going to uh, go through a few slides, which will launch momentarily, that will give an overview of um, the challenge and, and, and this response. We're then going to have our special assistant to end homelessness, Sarah Russell, the city special assistant to end homelessness, Sarah Russell, and also a co-chair of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance. She's going to fill in some of the details of these proposals. Then we're going to hear from some of our key partners in this effort. We're going to hear from Will Town, who uh, uh, is the other co-chair of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, as well as a leader at Spectrum. We're going to hear from Paul Dragon of CBOYO, the executive director. We're going to hear from Kim Fitzgerald, who is the CEO of Cathedral Square. Elaine Soto, who is the Howard Center Community Support Program Director. And Steve Murray, the Burlington Housing Authority Executive Director. So that's the plan. Then at the end, of course, as we always do on these briefings, we'll, we'll open it up for members of the media to ask questions of any of the panelists. Before going through all that, I do want to start with some overarching remarks. I, um, <clears throat> as I said in a statement um, more than a week ago now, I do support an orderly end to the troubled pandemic era motel program. I support a sun next of this program as the state is moving towards. Clearly, um, this was never meant to be a, a permanent program. It's being paid for with emergency funds. And there have certainly been significant management issues um, and problems in, in, the, in, the, in the program throughout its existence. Um, however, for the state to later this summer, as is the current plan, and as recently as last week, we saw further official communications from the state indicating for them at the end of July to turn out elderly Vermonters, people living with disabilities, and worst of all, young children and families to live in tents or in congregate shelters for months would be unacceptable. Uh, I think anyone who has raised a child um, just has to picture what it would be like to spend weeks or months trying to raise a family in a congregate shelter on, a, on cots in big open spaces or shared rooms is just uh, uh, an outcome that we of desperation that we should seek to avoid um, if at all possible. And what we want to show in this briefing is that with a little bit of planning and time, um, this outcome is completely avoidable. With our partners, we are going to lay out an alternative path to for sunsetting this program uh, for Chittenden County uh, <clears throat> residents that is humane, that is feasible, and that is affordable. So with that, let's get into to some of the the, the details and, and, and the, the plan. I want to start by just sort of setting the overall stage of how the city has been approaching homelessness in recent years. In At the end of 2021, we released a housing as a human right 10-point action plan 
And many of those 10 points were focused squarely on addressing the problem of homelessness. So we indicated that we were going to spend $5 million, at least $5 million of the city's ARPA, um, Emergency American Rescue Plan Act funds um, for initiatives to, for, I think there's a little bit of a typo in that, that slide, but what we, we said is $5 million would be spent on housing it. Um, with uh, a, a significant percentage of that, at least a million, not $1, for initiatives that serve the chronically homeless. We actually already have committed more than $3 million of funds squarely, uh, of those funds towards homelessness, uh, short-term homelessness uh, interventions. Um, and we are planning, are hoping in the coming months to be able to commit the other $2 million to long-term permanent housing for formerly homeless households. We um, uh, have created the special assistant to end homelessness position, and we are so fortunate to have Sarah Russell serving in that position, as anyone watching this briefing is going to, I'm sure, agree with in a moment when I hand this over to Sarah and she can uh, lay out um, her perspective on, on this current crisis. We have made investments in the Chittenden County Coordinated Entry Command Center team, and what you'll see is the the strategy that we, this alternative path that we are laying out today relies very heavily on that coordinated entry system in that team. Um, <clears throat> we have this longer term goal of building 78 new homes for formerly homeless residents. Uh, some of those homes are, many of those homes are already in construction. We have opened the 35 bed new low barrier shelter at Elmwood Avenue. That was one of, that was point number five, and that has now been operating since January successfully. Um, and then uh, you can see the, the balance of the um, housing action plan items, which are a little bit less squarely on point with homelessness. But of course, anything that increases the overall supply of housing should be thought of as an anti-homelessness strategy because we know the biggest single driver in in in, in homelessness the reason uh the biggest single driver is the lack of homes and um you know we're overarching vermont by some measures has the second worst homelessness problem of all 50 states uh from my perspective, it's clear that one of the reasons of that is because of our overall state housing supply challenges where we've made it way too hard built to build and just haven't had nearly enough homes created in recent decades. Let's keep going with the overview here. Okay, so this, uh, this kind of really speaks to that housing supply, overall housing supply issue and how we are um, in Burlington, very much trying to increase overall housing production to have a, a, a medium and long-term impact on this challenge. And you can see there um, the both uh, creation of homes in, in recent years, as well as what's projected in blue in the immediately coming years, either projects that are um, in construction or permitted. And, um, all of this information can also be found on the city's housing dashboard. I'll just add, let's, let's keep advancing. This is an important slide, which, um, which I think we'll be coming back to this later as well. What this shows is that the coordinated entry system that we, that has been um, around for about a decade in Chittenden County, it's a joint effort, again, between dozens of different organizations that work on homeless in one way or another. It's something the city has been very committed to since its creation uh, uh, about um, uh, seven years ago. Um, and it's something the city used its ARPA funds to further invest in at the end. You know, we announced that at the end, again at the end of 2021. We can see here that this coordinated entry system is um, consistently placing a significant number of people on a month-by-month -month basis in permanent housing. And what you can see is for the last more than a quarter now, we have been housing at least 25 households per month. And if we can continue doing that, um, uh, which we are confident we can, um, and when I say we here, I want to be clear again that I'm talking about the full coalition, um, then uh, that, that becomes a very powerful strategy for housing, um, housing the folks that we are, are talking about um, in the motel program that are losing their housing at the end of July. 
let's uh, let's keep going. This is a quick summary of the uh, shelter capacity that we have added in Burlington since 2020. Before 2020, the city had no low barrier year-round shelter capacity. It was something we had been talking about, attempting to create for some time. Um, but there were that we had we had no facilities. We now have two. We have the, the first was the a new place, 55 bed facility on Shelburne Road. Um, and the second was the emergency uh, shelter on Elmwood Avenue, which has an additional 35 beds. We have also working with partners, opened a community resource center, a day station that serves 80 to 160 people daily. That is a uh, complimentary to these emergency shelters and it, it, it's, it has meant that the effort that we collectively have been able to galvanize, uh, galvanize, it does more than simply offer a bed, it offers a range of services for people who are in these challenging circumstances as well. So now this, we're gonna start to really look at the numbers of what the sunset of the motel program is gonna mean. Um, last week, um, <clears throat> the latest data that we have from the state is that there were 170 households that either lost their hotel housing, motel housing um, last week, or I have heard some indication that some, some of these facilities have granted short extensions. Um, that, so that there are 170 households with 194 people who were impacted by last week's deadline. What, um, uh, there's another 184 households, including 300, 318 people that are currently projected to lose their, their ability to stay in motels at the end of July, July 28th. Within that universe, about 165 of those households um, include high need individuals. And those needs can inc include what is listed here on the screen. So there are 56 families uh, that have 115 children. There are 15 people within this group that are over 65 years old, 92 people with disabilities, 20 people receiving home health or hospice services, um, again, something services that would be very challenging to receive in a congregate setting. There are, are two pregnant people and four households fleeing domestic violence. So what we're going to lay out now are strategies that um, for, for all of this need. And there's really three, three separate related uh, strategies. So first of all, Burlington's LOI submitted last week would establish an emergency congregate shelter for up to 50 people in downtown um, Burlington. This is an additional shelter on top of the two that I just discussed. Um, co-located at that shelter, and I think Sarah Russell will, will kind of get into some of the details of this, co-located at that facility would be a day shelter with access to services, that would be available both for those up to 50 people that were living in this uh, congregate facility as well as 25 other uh, people that may need additional services. And then finally, the third strategy, and this one is the strategy that will be part of the later LOI expected later this week, the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance would support the transition of 165 households the 165 households I was just speaking about to permanent housing over a five to eight month period beyond the end, beyond that July 28th date. Um, <clears throat> there would also be joint advocacy for extent, and basically we are advocating for the extension of a motel stay for those households until they can be placed. Um, we are projecting that five to eight month period based on that track record of this of the coordinated entry system housing 25 households a month. If we're able to focus that capacity, which there um, is consensus within the Alliance that we should do, if we are able to focus that capacity on these 165 households, they will all be housed by the end of that 
uh, up to eight month period, the cost of that will be declining um, with each week as additional households are, are, are placed. The, uh, the, the projected budget for this strategy is a little over $2 million um, for the first two items, the co-located shelters. I want to be clear, it, it, I, this is a little bit, uh, and again, this is, uh, that, those are annualized costs. Um, the proposal actually would not have them lasting for a, a full year. The proposal would have these uh, shelters only um, existing, uh, that only being needed until the adverse weather condition um, program begins again in um, at the beginning of the winter. And so the actual cost of that, would, that is an annualized cost. The actual cost would be a four or five month cost. <clears throat> and then for item number three, strategy number three, uh, the projection is that it would cost an approximately $1.7 million for extended hotel stays until all 165 um, households could be housed. And sorry, that's a, a range of 1.7 to 2 million, depending on whether uh, we are able to uh, house 25 households a month or a little bit less less than that. It is possible um, with the that that things could speed up even and that it could be um, uh, even less money ultimately. That is uh, the basic, um, the outline of the plan. And I think at this point, um, we, uh, I think Sarah Russell is gonna come on and, and take it from here. Sarah, are you there? I'm here, thanks. Great, Can you hear me you. okay? We can hear you and now we can see you as well. Now you can see me, great. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as the mayor mentioned, um, the uh, Chittenden County Homeless Alliance is our local continuum of care and is comprised of stakeholders, including social service and housing agencies, community members, and people with lived experience of homelessness or housing insecurity from across Chittenden County. Uh, we work in close collaboration with um, our partners at the Balance of State continuum of care as well. Um, and in addition to the city's LOI, the CCHA, as well as other partner agencies um, have submitted um, letters of interest in response to the motel program closure. Um, I serve as one of two chairs of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance or CCHA, as you'll hear us uh, refer to it as. Um, and Will Town, uh, my other co-chair, will present um, CCHA's uh, letter of interest and speak a little more about our community's method to ensure equity and coordination and access to housing resources. Um, generally speaking, and also as part of um, as part of our advocacy um, as a community. Um, you'll also hear, as the mayor mentioned, from some of our community partners who um, have submitted letters of interest um, to Agency of Human Services as well. Um, and it's all of this work, um, it's important to understand that all of this work fits um, in, fits in together. Um, so we're all supporting that work. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, the um, emergency shelter um, proposal on the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so as you heard, the city uh, submitted its LOI on June 1st uh, with a focus on expanding emergency overnight and daytime shelter for adults. Um, the overnight semi-congregate shelter will accommodate uh, up to 50 guests. Um, in the evening, we propose utilizing the largely vacant state office building at 108 Cherry Street due to its proximity to resources, services, and transportation. Uh, while best practice indicates non-congregate shelter is ideal in most cases, the building would allow offices to be used for shelter accommodations for one to four adults, um, in addition to planning space for staff and a daytime shelter available to the community for up to 75 people, which we'll talk about on the next slide a little bit more. Uh, while the budget is annualized, as the mayor said, the shelter is expected to operate until adverse weather conditions go into effect. That's usually in late November, early December. Um, and the guests remaining in the shelter at that time who have not obtained permanent housing um, or other options will transition into motels under the adverse weather conditions provision at that time. 
Um, due to overtaxed community agencies and a severe uh, shortage in um, staffing across not just in Chittenden County, but statewide um, for social service providers, um, the city has considered working with a staffing agency to ensure safe ratios of guests and staff on site at all times. Um, we We'll also be, we're curious to hear, um, uh, some of you may know the state of Vermont has issued um, a request for proposals uh, looking for um, uh, looking for staffing resources to be utilized by uh, nonprofit organizations, um, specifically around shelter, um, shelter capacity. Um, so we are uh, looking forward to hearing the results of that um, RFP process. Um, we are in close coordination with the Agency of Human Services uh, and have not yet received confirmation of use of this location um, at this time, but are uh, moving through pro um, inspection, uh, habitability, and safety um, processes that need to be in place before a decision can be made around that. Uh, so next I'll talk about the D-Time, the co-located D-Time shelter um, is also part of the city's uh, letter of interest proposal. Um, the budget that we submitted along, um, with the LOI includes both overnight and daytime shelter staff. Um, so that would be 24 seven staff um, is what that budget um, is what that budget recognizes. Um, the, we would, including shelter staff would also, or in addition to shelter staff, would also include case management on site, meals on site and resources available on site. Um, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity is the current operator of the daytime shelter or the community resource center located at Feeding Chittenden. They routinely report up to 160 visitors to their location daily, and that was before the closure of the motel um, program on uh, June 1st last week. Um, our concern is that people exiting the motels um, could cause an overflow of guests at that location. Um, therefore, we're proposing a secondary daytime location shelter um, to open. Um, it will also be open during the weekends um, and would serve as an additional cooling center in the summer months within the city. Uh, we hope to coordinate partnerships for medical recovery, mental harm reduction supports, um, and mental health services um, as well to be available on site. Uh, next, Will, as I mentioned, Will Town uh, from Spectrum is also the co-chair of um, the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, and he will share with you a little bit more about um, CCHA's LOI in response to the motel program closure. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mayor, for the, the great introduction to this. Um, and so what I wanted to quickly do before diving in was just provide a uh, brief overview of what our coordinated entry system is. So if we can jump to the next slide very quickly, that would be helpful. And then um, we can go into this one. Great. Um, so coordinated entry is a system that streamlines access to housing supports and resources. Um, it was developed to assess and match households experiencing homelessness for eligible services based on vulnerability, sustainability, and length of homelessness through a standardized scored assessment. Uh, each, house, each eligible household will be referred to housing case management and added to a master list of homeless households, which is reviewed on a weekly basis by coordinated entry partners for appropriate housing opportunities. And it really is just a tool for equitable access to housing opportunities. Um, and it also helps us better identify the needs um, regarding housing that face our community. So back to the proposal that the CCHA is looking at. Um, you know, when we look at who will be exiting the motels on July 28th, as the mayor uh, talked about earlier, we really do see a large number of extremely vulnerable people, including families, people with disabilities, receiving home health and hospice care, uh, seniors, pregnant households. And it, it's the position of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance that placement of these people in a congregate setting, um, just it's damaging, unsuitable, uh, borderline inhumane. So what we are proposing is that we're advocating for an extension of the motel stay for vulnerable households 
Um, and we will closely collaborate with housing and service providers to prioritize resources leading to rapid placements in permanent housing or transitional housing for these households and motels. Uh, the data indicates we are able to house on average 25 households per month through our coordinated entry system. Uh, in addition to expediting uh, motel exits to housing as part of this countywide collaboration, Howard Center has also agreed to prioritize these households for mental health and substance use services. Within our LOI, we are requesting funding for a staff person to help manage this process, coordinate case managers, and also work directly with housing providers to match households with appropriate housing resources, including available units, rental subsidy, and retention services when necessary. We estimate uh, if AHS agrees to extend the motel stays that we can house these 165 households by February 24, um, pending that all the resources that we expect to come online do in fact do that. So for us, our next steps really, uh, as alluded to earlier, June 8th, we're having a meeting and what we will be doing is voting to approve a prioritization policy for the following subpopulations within the motels. That would be families with minor children, people receiving home health and hospice services and seniors that are 65 years and older. Um, and what that will do is allow us to prioritize those populations for housing opportunities and get them moved out of the hotels as quickly as possible. And I think that sums it up. Sorry, I didn't miss anything on that. Nothing then, more to add. Thanks, well. Yeah, this is this is the same coordinated entry slide, which just shows um, in the last quarter that we're averaging over 25 households placed into permanent housing per month, and we expect that to continue. Great. Thank you very much, Will. Um, and that's just a little. So sorry. So next up, we have. Uh, Paul Dragon from the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, Paul is, my understanding is, is trying to join us by phone. And so. Hello. There you go, Paul. Um, welcome. Yeah, hi. And, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for making this work despite um, being, uh, I believe, uh, on the road right now. So um, we have a slide about CVOEO up for you to, to speak from and uh, why don't you go for it. Yeah, thank you so much, Mayor. Sorry, I couldn't be on video. I am on the board for the National Community Action Partnership. So we have a conference here in Foxborough. So I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank the mayor. I wanna thank Sarah, the city and all our partners on this call. Uh, this is what this is what it's going to take to solve homelessness. It's going to take us all working together as a community at the municipal level, the state level, and certainly at the organizational level. So, for CVOEO, we have housing advocates. We we cover uh, four counties, including Chittenden County. We also have some statewide programs of housing advocates all through the four counties. We have a, uh, quite a few housing advocates in Burlington. We run, as you heard the uh, mayor say, the Community Resource Center uh, in Burlington. We also have street outreach and a mobile van, and we provide some services over at the Elmwood uh, Pods as well. And then our Feeding Chitin program uh, gets out literally thousands of meals every day uh, to the Resource Center, uh, to the Champlain Inn, and to many of the hotels in the area for uh, people experiencing homelessness. So. Uh, we think it's really important to have a very um, thoughtful um, and uh, methodical uh, kind of conclusion to the motel program and uh, to take this step by step, as Will said, as Sarah said, and as the mayor said, um, because we have an opportunity here to keep people safe. Um, and that's really, really important. So what uh, CVOEO has is we are now operating the home program. It is a it is a housing, a rapid rehousing program for families with children who are experiencing homelessness. We currently have 100 vouchers, and with the passage of the state budget, we will have another 150. That gives us 250 vouchers for families with children experiencing homelessness. Um, and we estimate, uh, it's hard to get the exact data, but we estimate there's five to 600 families statewide who are experiencing homelessness. 
So we can get close to solving uh, family homelessness if we can commit these 250 vouchers. And then if we can keep up this effort with what I think is a minimal amount of money uh, annually uh, to invest in uh, solving child homelessness. And the reason why we want to solve child homelessness is because, um, of course, children and families are super vulnerable, but it's also a preventative measure because we know if a child even has one brief experience of, experience of, of homelessness as a child, they're more likely uh, to not succeed in school uh, to have adverse health effects and to be homeless themselves as adults. So this is uh, real upstream, preven uh, upstream prevention. Uh, we also said that we would, um, in our LOI, our letter of interest, we, we are calling for more uh, outreach. We think if uh, we can extend the motel stay, we'll have opportunity for our current street outreach team to expand and not only work with people who are um, uh, outside on the streets, but also who are in hotels so we can engage them with services and help them find links to either a uh, uh, new emer emergency shelter, existing emergency shelter, transitional housing, or permanent housing. So uh, that's going to be another strong effort. And then the other thing that we're thinking of doing, not in our letter of interest, but we're planning on uh, increasing our food capacity and outreach through our feeding chitin program so we can get more people fed, both in the out street outreach program, but also at the hotels. Um, because food insecurity, as you know, kind of co-occurs with uh, homelessness. So CVOEO is really happy to work with our partners on the call with the mayor's office. Um, and when we all work together, we're going to have a lot better outcomes and hopefully we'll help to end all homelessness and child homelessness. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. We really appreciate you uh, zooming in um, from uh, from Foxborough. Thank you for your partnership with this. <laughs> Um, we have two more speakers. Um, next, we have Kim Fitzgerald from Cathedral Square, the CEO of Cathedral Square. Uh, welcome, Kim. Thank you for being part of this briefing. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for having me be part of it. Uh, yeah, currently, Cathedral Square houses over 200 people who were formerly homeless. That's before those exiting the motel program. We have found that the key to making the transition into long-term housing successful is through trusted relationships that begin as soon as possible and last beyond the person being housed and continual support services throughout that entire process. Everyone has a unique set of circumstances and there's no one size that fits all. Each person needs a plan with support to help them be successful. Although living in motels is not the preferred or long-term solution, we cannot have vulnerable Vermonters out in the street with no place to start getting the support and services they need to find long-term, safe, and sustainable housing. We need to work with each person, develop a plan, and help them execute it. We owe it to these Vermonters to align our work and improve and expedite the processes to find long-term solutions. This will only happen if we work together and with intention. So we are very proud to work alongside the city of Burlington and our partner housing and service providers in the Burlington area to focus on this really essential work. Thank you for having me here today. Great, thank you, Kim. Thank you for your work and thanks again for being here. And then finally, um, uh, sorry, we have two more speakers um, from the Howard Center. Elaine Soto is joining us. Um, uh, Howard Center works with, she's proud to partner with Howard Center on so many areas. We're uh, grateful to be doing it, it again on this issue. Elaine, thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, my name is Elaine Soto. I'm the Director of Community Support Programs at Howard Center and also a member of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance. Howard Center is happy to support this effort along with our community partners to prioritize these populations. It's consistent with our mission to help people and communities thrive by providing supports and services to address mental health, substance use, and developmental needs. We know that without secure housing, one's mental health suffers greatly. It's quite enough to struggle with a mental health disability. We don't need to add homelessness to the equation. 
we are committed to supporting our homeless clients and are thankful to our housing partners in this effort. Thanks for including us. Thank you again, Elaine. Finally, um, I believe we have Stephen Murray, the Executive Director of the Burlington Housing Authority. Steve, are you, are you with us? Hi, Stephen, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, although Burlington Housing Authority is not, the, uh, is not focused on emergency housing or transitional housing, uh, we are the past pathway to permanent housing through our housing choice voucher, uh, colloquially known as Section 8. Uh, we've met with the city, uh, Sarah in particular, uh, about what vouchers we currently have available. We did discuss some of our family unification vouchers. We discussed um, the uh, NED vouchers or the mainstream vouchers that we, we currently have available. And we also discussed the fact that we do have three buildings that are focused on uh, elderly, our elderly RAD buildings, um, and that of the 14 elderly that are currently homeless, we, we do feel by the end of the summer, we could put a large, uh, we could house a significant portion of them permanently. Um, we, we also have something called a local preference and a homeless preference. Local preferences for Section 8, homeless preference would be for our multifamily properties. Uh, and we have agreed to be uh, much more aggressive on the local preferences uh, for those coming out of the hotels. Uh, they still have to uh, abide by all the Section 8 uh, requirements, but uh, we, we feel that uh, um, if we can uh, find someone who perhaps has already uh, has a household set up for them, that we could make that uh, voucher appear much quicker than uh, how it would normally. Um, also, just on the good news is uh, we are looking at, by the end of the summer, uh, Brave Baron Apartments, uh, which is uh, uh, Champlain Housing Trust, we have assigned them 20 home, all homeless uh, uh, project-based vouchers. Uh, O'Brien Farms, which is Summit, uh, we also have uh, 12 project-based vouchers. We're expecting that in the fall or late summer. And then um, we have another uh, eight units for O'Brien Farm, which is Summit, um, also all homeless, uh, coming on in December. And we are looking at COTS, which is the Main Street Family Housing, uh, with 16 units of February. So we are we are actively looking for landlords, and we are actively um, tying some of the project-based vouchers to uh, a coordinated entry system, much like with Zypher Place, where 36 of those apartments uh, were vouchers tied to uh, coordinated entry. So we are we are not working directly on the emergency or transitional housing, but we are definitely trying to put as many vouchers out there as possible uh, for those people who are um, suffering uh, being unhoused. Uh, this is a good opportunity for me to shout out to landlords. I, we have a significant portion of uh, vouchers that uh, we currently have 89 families looking for apartments right now. So if any landlords out there are interested in being part of the solution for this, uh, reach out to us and we can discuss um, how the housing choice voucher, uh, Section 8 voucher works. It, it's, uh, it's absolutely a backbone for us getting people into permanent housing. Uh, we are also uh, looking to put in a, a letter of intent. Um, half the battle is getting everyone housed after that is keeping everyone housed. We, we have a retention department and a huge shout out to them. Um, if you are a Section 8 uh, landlord or a Section 8 participant, or you live in one of our properties, uh, you are entitled to have some help with uh, staying housed, whether it be uh, working with your landlord or working uh, to pay back uh, past due rents, et cetera. But we are definitely struggling with uh, um, that right now. We we are expecting to have about 850 referrals year to date to our housing retention team to help people to keep people housed. Put that in perspective, that was about 250 prior to uh, COVID. So we will also be looking uh, for some funding so that once we do get the vouchers out there and we do get people permanently housed, that we can give them some support services uh, in order to keep them housed. Um, and I do want to thank uh, Sarah for all the work you did on uh, on getting us all together and uh, hopefully 
um, Burlington Housing Authority can uh, get a whole group of people permanently housed within the next eight months. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yes, sir. Okay, with that, um, I believe we that is the end of the presentations, and I see we have a large number of uh, members of the media with us. And the way we um, have run this in the past, if you could uh, use the raise hand function, we will to recognize you and allow you to ask your question directly. Great. I see Liam Eller Connors there. Go ahead, Liam. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, have you gotten any indication from the administration that they'd be willing to extend uh, the motel program for these households that you're hoping that they'll extend them for? So, Liam, I, I want to reiterate that the way that this program, the way that this um, Proposal has come together has has happened quickly with the uh, the really the deadlines driven by state decisions. So um, we uh, were in kind of invited to propose uh, ideas and solutions on May 22nd. The city responded on June 1st. We did in the interim have one. Um, a uh, very high level uh, meeting between city staff uh, that I attended um, and that um, had AHS, the Agency of Human Service staff there. There have been numerous other conversations. Um, I would say up until now, the, uh, the state has been quite clear that um, their goal is to end the hotel program on July 28th. And that was reiterated after the meeting that we had with them in a formal communication from the Department of Children and Families. Um, our hope is that by galvanizing, uh, you know, by so many partners coming together to make such a clear statement, uh, to have a detailed plan, a, a detailed alternative, that um, AHS uh, and the Montpelier leaders will rethink that plan. It's certainly clear to me that there remain um, a lot of conversations going on in Montpelier about the best way forward. And while we have not heard an approval for this plan yet, um, we think it's a, again, it's it's an affordable plan. It's a feasible plan. It's a humane plan. Um, it uh, We have a track record as a, as a coalition of uh, housing hundreds of formerly homeless households, families and, and individuals in, in recent months. And uh, we think this is the best path forward and we hope others will see that as well, but we do not have an agreement on this yet. Okay, so it sounds like they, I mean, it, it sounds like they kind of said no, which is that how you'd characterize it? <clears throat> this has been moving so quickly, Liam, that I, I would not say there has yet been a moment where we've been able to lay out all this detail that we just came together, you know, these letters of interest are still coming together. We haven't really had the opportunity to fully lay it out and get um, and make sure that the state is fully understanding what they're saying no to. Um, and we now, uh, we, we thought there was urgency to lay this out publicly and lay this out for all the state decision makers who um, are, are meeting actively now and will be meeting in the weeks ahead. There will be, a, as everyone knows, a veto session where this there's been a lot of discussion around um, this uh, this issue, and so yeah, we haven't heard yes yet. I, I would not say this detailed plan in this form with these estimates has been explicitly rejected by the state either at this point. And then with the the shelter proposal um, at Cherry Street, the state hasn't signed off on that either. It also sounds like there's some inspections. Can you just? give us a little bit more information on what actually needs to be done yeah. to make that a reality. I mean, I also can't imagine office space is all, is all that hospitable as a living environment. There has been more detailed conversation around that. Maybe Sarah, could you speak to the status of those conversations? Sure, yeah, um, I can definitely speak to that. And um, one of the things I also wanted to mention to um, Liam is that um, according to the state this morning, we have a call, they're hosting um, <clears throat> calls with community providers uh, fairly routinely at this point. Um, 
they, I did inquire about the status of the LOIs that have been submitted so far. Again, the deadline was June 30th. Um, they are continuing, they notified us that they are continuing to receive LOIs. Um, so that was um, what started as a hard deadline has turned into a bit of a rolling deadline um, at this point. Um, but as of June 1st, they had received 44 letters of interest from across the state um, from representing all of the different communities. Um, I did inquire about sort of what the substance was of those LOIs, if they were purely for emergency shelter, if they were um, involving other services, and um, the state had not yet um, reviewed all of those, um, and they did not um, have data to share around the nature of those LOIs. So just to, that's the most recent update that we have from uh, the state at this point. Um, with regard to your question around the emergency shelter, uh, we are in uh, communication um, with Agency of Human Services uh, to have them uh, conduct the various required um, health and safety inspections that need to happen on site. Uh, we do anticipate that um, there, there may be um, some capital investment required up front at first to um, convert uh, some of the office space into appropriate shelter space. Uh, and those would be conversations that we would uh, engage AHS with um, as we progress. Um, so we don't have notification from them on the location, uh, confirmation of the location, but they are, um, actively working to assess that location uh, for an emergency shelter site. Thanks. I'll let uh, some others ask some questions. I think it's worth pointing out, as Sarah mentioned, capital items, the, 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 the budget estimate did include um, some capital investment as, as well. So I see uh, Lily St. Angelo uh, has a hand up as well. Lily. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, just to clarify, was it DCF who 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 asked for these LOIs? Yes, that's right. It was um, it was uh, Chris Winters and DCF issued the the request for LOIs. The state has assembled a team of um, leaders from across um, all of the state agencies, um, including housing, um, transportation. Um, it, Agency of Human Services, Department of, of um, Health, to uh, et cetera, to review all of the LOIs as they come in and pull in resources from different departments as necessary. Okay, and that was in response, that was just in response to this program ending? Okay. And then um, I was wondering, is there any initiatives um, happening to help with storage of belongings as people are exiting the motels? Do you want me to speak to that? Go ahead, sorry, yeah. Thanks. Um, one of the observations that we received from the outreach teams um, uh, last week on Friday as folks were exiting was that there was a need for storage um, for some people. So um, that is something that we um, have been in communication with um, CBOEO um, around trying to identify safe storage for folks as they um, exit motel, both now or immediately in the short term and um, again, in, um, in the longer term after the July 28th motel exits. Okay, and one more question about um, camping enforcement. I know there's gonna be a, several talks with city council around that this summer, um, but do you have any idea of, of how you will enforce camping this summer? So Lily, yes, the city has, um, so he has policies about this. I, I, as I think this briefing should be seen in the in the context uh, of that policy and the city's goals. We believe strongly that uh, camping, sanctioned camping, is not a safe, reliable uh, uh, solution or, or uh, response to increased numbers of, of unsheltered folks, and that that is. You know, fundamentally, why we are stepping forward and saying the city will operate a third a low barrier uh, day, sta day, day station and um, congregate over overnight shelter. We think that kind of uh, option within a building is a 
much preferable option to more people um, sleeping outside in, in tents. And um, we, I think it should be noted, I'm not sure we've said it yet on the briefing that there probably is going to be a need in Chittenden County, um, given this increased number of people, given the ending of this program, there's a concern, everyone has a concern, including the state has a concern that the unsheltered population uh, will go up more than 50 people. And so there it should be pointed out that there are other sites in Chittenden County that are being considered and other municipalities that are considering uh, uh, stepping up here as well. And I think if, if there is going to be uh, an additional congregate shelter open beyond the, the one that we're talking about here, um, it is uh, a significant goal of the cities that that additional shelter be in, in another municipality. So um, that's the thrust of our strategy for if there are, if there is increased pressure on the, the existing resources, if there are more people who are unsheltered as is expected, is a large high possibility given this closure, uh, it, it, is, it is through these Congress shelters that we'll seek to house folks. What will we be doing about, uh, about camping? You know, we have, we have policies that are on the, on the books that have been on the books for a long time. And we, um, uh, we have a team here within the city that, um, that will be enforcing those rules or attempting to enforce those rules. And we will, as you're, as you mentioned, there will be a further discussion about that, uh, in a work session at the city council today. Um, uh, and, you know, again, I think, uh, the, the camping discussion should be seen in the, in this context of trying to keep these high need vulnerable households in in the hotels until they can be permanently housed and uh, in the context of setting up another congress shelter. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, uh, Pat, Pat Bradley. Pat, you should be able to unmute yourself and speak, I believe. All right, well, um, Pat, it, yeah, well, what we're seeing if we can get Pat on, um, there's a question, a clarifying question from in, uh, Kevin at seven days, Kevin McCollum about the, the budget numbers. So are we asking the state to fund the entire 2.06 million in the 1.7 to $2 million extension? Uh, we are, we, we are proposing that the state fund the 1.7 to $2 million extension for the high need households beyond the July 28th date. Um, we the 2.06 million again is an annualized cost. Not all of that should be necessary if the um, if the shelter is ended when the adverse weather conditions program restarts. It will, it, it, which would be you know a little less than six months from, uh, from now. Um, it since some capital costs. I'm not sure if you're able to say how much of that 2.2 million, Sarah, is capital cost. Uh, you know, it will be more than. Um, the prorated monthly share because there are some uh, capital costs that are kind of some some costs. But can you speak to that? Sure. Um, from my recollection, I think that we budgeted around or a request around a hundred thousand um, dollars at max for capital improvements um, prior to being able to open the space. Again, that's without seeing building plans or having a tour of the building. So that was uh, that was an estimate. And, you know, we should say, um, you know, when you're talking about millions of dollars, that's significant funds. They're um, in the budget that was vetoed. My understanding is there was $12 million for transition costs. So this would be proposals that could uh, address that we believe there's a potential funding source um, in, in that budget uh, if um, that budget is uh, 
uh, ultimately, ultimately passed. And um, so uh, it's in that context that we're proposing these solutions and we believe there is potential funding for them. Pat, uh, are you still trying to get on? Yeah, I am. Can you hear me? You can. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a portable webcam that is always weird. Um, my question goes back to the uh, budget, the projected budget that you mentioned, 2.06 million for the shelters and the 1.7 to $2 million for the extended motel stays. Um, where will that money come from? So Pat, I don't know if you caught the end of my, my last answer. One potential source, and it should be noted, it's certainly not the only potential source the state has for uh, emergency shelter for, for housing costs, but there, um, the, the, the budget that the governor vetoed that is under consideration for a veto override uh, would um, have $12 million directly in it for transitioning out at the end of the motel program. So that would be a, a clear potential source that has been identified and um, uh, but certainly not the only place the state could could do this emergency kind of investment from. Are you confident though that you know the state, you know, this is kind of reliant on the veto session approving that that scenario. Um, are you confident that that money could be available? So, um, Pat, I, we are, um, I think it, there's, a, there's clarity that the, there is capacity from emergency funds, funds if that if that budget is approved. And so I think it's important to point out that um, the plan that we are laying out here uh, is in, in, in many ways is consistent with a, with a veto override. Um, if the legislature chooses to go in a different direction working with, uh, with the state government, there's certainly um, other ways that this could be addressed as, uh, as well. Uh, so um, I, again, if, Given, given the discussions about how the pro, this hotel program uh, needs to be transitioned and, and sunsetted, uh, we think the figures that were being laid out here um, for addressing Chittenden counties, uh, <clears throat> these are at least most of the costs that would be ne needed in, in Chittenden County for this transition. It, um, it, it's just that it, this is a feasible and affordable budget within the context of the dollars that have been discussed so far. And Mayor, a non-money question along um, the, the situation here. In the governor's weekly briefings, he's noted several times that he and his administration have been working with the people in the hotels and motels for months for the transition. And, and he has used the phrase months. And yet everybody seems to be scrambling right now at this very quick transition. So where's the dichotomy here? Why does it seem to be catching people off guard when the governor is saying that they've been working with these uh, individuals for months? So again, Pat, um, just go back to the timeline we talked about here. The municipalities were invited into this discussion by the state in a formal way to be part of the problem solving um, uh, on May 22nd. Um, the, we, have, we, of course, the, the alliance, the organizations that are working on homelessness certainly have been working on this challenge um, throughout throughout this period, and as one of those slides showed, has you know has housed a couple hundred, um, more than two hundred uh, homeless uh, individuals and households over the last year. So, of course, all the partners you heard from today, the city, everyone has been working on one aspect of this challenge in terms of helping the state deal with the ending of what has been. You know, they have been the agency that has been managing, funding, creating, thinking through this program. They just brought municipalities uh, and other local actors into this uh, problem in a, in a formal way 
and just began sharing data with us in the last couple of weeks. And we are responding very quickly um, with, uh, we think a path through here that is an alternative to what's being considered that would be effective, affordable and feasible. Probably a little harsh, but it almost sounds like you were locked out of the process. <clears throat> I, I, you know, again, Pat, I just say we were only brought into the problem solving in a formal way in the last couple of weeks. Well, if I can speak to that from the Chittenden County, the perspective of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, um, I think that some, you know, comments have been, you know, made that I've heard around, you know, folks being isolated in the motels. Um, and then I've also heard comments that there's been active engagement, you know, with people in the hotels. And what I can say from our county's perspective, at least, is that there have, is that we have created, a, you know, new outreach teams to work extensively with these um, with these households and motels. However, <clears throat> we continue to see a lack of capacity within our system and being able to connect households in a timely manner to housing navigation services. So I think I think that's one of the challenges around, um, you know, connecting households. I think the last thing that I would say too is that there's there needs to be increased coordination between decisions made in the administration level and just, and you know, planning that's involved in the local community level. For example, in Chittenden County, we anticipate seeing 112 new homeless dedicated units come online within the calendar year, as you've heard Steve Murray mentioned, you know, just a few minutes ago with several projects that are just dedicated to um, households exiting homelessness. And so we're actively working with the resources that we have and are, we need to make sure that the timeline for these motel exits aligns with the resources that we have so that there's not a lapse in stability for these vulnerable households. Thank you. And thanks for being patient with my lack of technical prowess with the webcam. So um, thank you, Pat. Um, I see Kevin um, has a follow-up question in, in the chat about the state building being used. The question is, what has the state building been used for in the past and what is it being used for now? The, this is the state office building that it, in this most recent legislative session, the uh, gubernatorial administration proposed, and I believe the legislature approved, um, basically transitioning this building away from being a state office building and being uh, as they uh, no longer have the same office needs that they have had in the past. And so it is, you know, that's, that's the history of this building. It has been for, um, I think it's about a 20 year old building. Uh, I, I might be off on that, but uh, has been a state office building, but they've been moving away from that. Um, and so this would be essentially an interim use in that transition plan that the, the, there, there still would be some ongoing um, from Department of Health use of the building during this period, Sarah, I believe is the way we've, it's been considered, but a lot, of, a lot of the building currently is quite underutilized. You wanna add anything to that? Yeah. Not much to add. I, I know that they're, you know, hoping to, you know, have been in conversation around relocating staff for some time uh, separate from uh, this proposal. And then Kevin, sort of so the second part of the question was, have you considered doing something similar to city facility? In a sense, we already have with the, uh, the Elmwood Avenue facility that was a city owned property that um, we worked with uh, partners in the state to transition that into uh, an emergency facility. So um, this is certainly something that the city has been actively engaged in this, this challenge in a number of ways um, from the start. We think this is the best, uh, the best opportunity um, for the need right now. Um, go to you, Derek Brower from Seven Days. Yeah, uh, did, I, did I miss, did you say how quickly you envision being able to open the shelter at Cherry Street? I know you mentioned the Elmwood example. I mean, that that took quite a bit of time to, to get that set up. Yeah, fair question. It's definitely um, uh, a, there, there's a lot less complication in what would be needed here, but it won't happen overnight. Sarah, can you speak to your thinking on the, on the likely timeline? 
Sure. I mean, I think that um, the challenges that we ran into around the um, Elmwood shelter were related to um, supply chain and construction, um, you know, delays that, that I think everyone was seeing during the pandemic. Um, and with the existing building in place, um, we again, without seeing the building or seeing the plans for the building, um, we our hope would be that we could um, really expedite the opening of that shelter. And I'm not, I will make the distinction, certainly we don't have approval on this yet. The LOI only went in last Thursday. On the other hand, there has been um, a non-trivial amount of back and forth communications with senior um, officials at the state. And there, there um, seems to be uh, openness to con considering this. Um, uh, I would say we have had more favorable a response to this part of the proposal so far than um, the extended the extension on the high need population, which um, there's been less discussion of, and we have had less of a response so far. But we do we, we have reason to be hopeful that the state will be able to approve the use of the office building. I, I mean, is there any is there any kind of time horizon that you have in mind here? I mean, is could it be as soon as later this summer, or is it farther out? You want to answer that, sir? Sure. I, I mean, I think that it, with again, without seeing the building or the plans for the building, or understanding the scope of you know need that would or you know capa capacity that would need to be um, infused there to open as an emergency shelter, it's difficult to say. Um, I do. Our our goal would be to stand it up as rapidly as possible. And yes, I would I would hope by the end of the summer. Um, again, we're also you know reliant on uh, workforce um, challenges and staffing um, capacity as well. So um, those things pending as soon as reasonably possible is our time frame. Okay, and I see Patrick Crowley from VT Digger. Hi there, thanks. Uh, this is sort of a follow-up to the other questions about Cherry Street, but I know buildings and general services at the state had talked about uh, a potential desire to actually sell that building once they had moved employees out. Uh, I just, apologies if you address this, but I just want to be clear, the this scenario, does it, it doesn't involve a purchase, does this involve just sort of a lease from the state before they would sell it? Yeah, that's, that's the way we're thinking of it, Patrick, is that um, this might, you know, have, we're, we're talking about this as a short-term use, trying to get it open, as uh, Sarah and Derek were just discussing, as soon as possible. Uh, certainly the, the hope and belief, belief that might be possible is that it could be opened uh, this summer to deal with the extra pressures this summer and that it would be in place until the adverse weather conditions program begins again. And um, so we're talking about a matter of months and that could have some impact on the state's timeline for uh, their, their longer term plans for the building, but it would not, I, we don't think that what we're proposing here would fundamentally change um, uh, how the state is thinking about moving forward with the building. That's all I have, thank you. Okay, thank you. Very good. I am uh, not seeing any other hands um, from the media. So oh, uh, I spoke too soon. Uh, Liam has his hand up again. Go ahead, Liam. I just wanted to clarify uh, the financing. So all of these, all the financing for both the extending the motel and this Cherry Street project, that would come from the state. Um, is And is there any money that the city has that they'd be willing to chip in if the state seems unwilling to move forward with these um, these plans you have. So Liam, the, the state has, uh, as you know, um, emergency housing dollars, a variety of emergency housing sources that go beyond well beyond anything the the, the city has access to, and we think that that should be the, the funding source. And, and it's not just us who's think, thought that you know it was in the. The legislature's budget to uh, uh, to fund fund the transition, and we think that's the first place to to go for for resources. We should we certainly the city is 
already, as you're seeing on this call, putting significant staff resources towards trying to manage a response, trying to be a good partner uh, at the local level in um, <clears throat> helping to coordinate and implement uh, these plans. And we, and you know, so that's that's a cost that uh, is being borne on the municipal side. Uh, and um, that's that's what we're proposing at this point. And um, the shelter is slightly off, but the shelter on Shelburne Road, I know um, the operators that has been running that is no longer going to be running that. Um, have you been able to find someone to take over that? Where do you have any updates? I mean, that seems like having that operating is sort of important in this overall plan that you're you're pre presenting right here as well. Yeah, I agree with that statement. I think it is critical that that the that new shelter that we just put public funds towards purchasing um, in 2020 that from for the foreseeable future, I think that is going to be needed as a low barrier year round shelter it would be a big setback to our efforts if that were to cease operating. We had, uh, at this point have a commitment from a new place to operate that facility through the end of September, which gives us time for conversations with other agencies about uh, taking over the program, taking over the, the management and services uh, at that time. And we are in detailed conversations with Chittenden County organizations about doing that. Uh, we don't have anything permanent to announce yet, but I, I would say um, our goal is that the uh, we come out of this transition with that facility operating um, even better than it, it has up until now. Really what has been available at that site up until now has just been the overnight uh, housing services. Um, and we uh, would like to see something much more uh, like the Elmwood Avenue kind of public health approach to homelessness where uh, the housing services are combined with a concerted um, ongoing effort to get people the help they need to get into treatment, to get into permanent housing, to get into get back to work. And uh, we are seeing some success with that effort at Elmwood Avenue, and we'd like to have more of those services available at um, the Shelburne Road facility going forward. And so that that is part of the goal that the transition uh, be not just uh, someone taking over what a new place has done until now, but actually to be expanding um, what is happening there and, and, and really have a, a stronger program going forward. That's a major goal of the cities. Thank you. And I would say it's I, there, it's uh, a major goal of the states for that to continue as well. Um, I see Derek has a hand up again as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, one more question. Uh, you know, I hear often from folks who say that uh, they maybe have some kind of housing voucher, maybe Section 8 or something similar, and can't find a place to, to use it, a landlord who will will we'll rent at a, at a rate that's eligible. I, I mean, is this a moment where, uh, this is a question for you, Mayor, is this a moment where you, private landlords need to be stepping up to um, to consider offering more units at rates that uh, that where vouchers can be used? I think that that is uh, an on-point question right now with exactly what we're proposing here. Uh, many of the households, and I think this was mentioned earlier in the briefing, I, I'm not sure if you have that stat again, but uh, uh, Paul made a point about um, available vouchers as well. It, it's a sort of a further tragedy with the, what is being proposed here and, and, and what we're trying to avoid is, yeah, many, many of these high need households do have vouchers, do basically have a um, have the resources for permanent housing. They just haven't been matched up with a unit yet. Through this focus of the coordinated entry system, uh, what our plan relies on is not some um, sort of dramatic change in trajectory, but the uh, the sort of existing system using largely nonprofit owned uh, homes that have had government funding as those homes become available and as new homes come online, we would match the individuals in this, these 165 individuals with these households and they would become permanently housed. And the, what's really missing there is just time. And what this plan uh, does is expand the time. Um, you are right that if uh, some, that if the, uh, you, that if there was more uh, private 
property owners that participated in the voucher system that could expand the universe of, uh, of homes. It could accelerate the plan that we're talking about here. And it uh, would, uh, would, it would further address this sort of chronic situation that we have um, with, uh, with these vouchers existing, but not enough, enough homes. It is definitely explicitly one of the goals of um, CEDO and our, um, uh, our, our effort to address homelessness. It is one of the kind of medium and long-term strategies that I know Sarah is um, uh, we're actively working on and, and, and that we, it is, it is something we'd like to see. Um, we, um, it is uh, almost since the day she started, we also have been dealing with, with crises and dealing with the uh, setting up of new congregate shelters. And so uh, it's, I would say it's, it's a medium term goal and one that we um, think has the possibility of, um, uh, of having a further impact. Thank you. Okay, um, now uh, I spoke to you soon before, but now I'm not seeing any for, further hands. We've been um, we've been at this for for over an hour, so uh, if I, I think we're at a point where we can wrap up this briefing again, some of this discussion is going to be repeated at the city council work session that uh, I believe starts is at six o'clock tonight, Sarah. The work session, or is it later? Six six. six we believe it's 6.30, and um, thank you everyone for, for joining and participating in this. I want to thank our, our partners uh, who've been on the line throughout as well. Thank you for really being uh, on the front lines of this challenge and working very hard day in and day out to do right by some of the most vulnerable Vermonters and Chittenden County residents that there are. Um, none, of, none of the discussion we've been talking about today would be possible with, uh, without the outstanding housing nonprofits that um, we're fortunate to, to have here and work with. So thank you, everyone. Uh, more soon. Talk to you soon.